Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Jade. I'm the Science Communication Manager for the Museum of Natural History and together with a lot of other awesome partners including uh, the City of Ann Arbor Natural Area Preservation, we have been helping uh, drum up momentum for the City Nature Challenge and uh, I wanted to recap on what exactly that is just uh, for folks at home who may be watching this later. Um, but uh, before we do that, just a few kind of ground rules to help make sure this goes smooth and that everyone gets a chance to contribute. Uh, golden rule for video events, mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Uh, this will help cut down on feedback. And if you haven't already, go ahead and log into the iNaturalist website. So if you have an observation that you want to share to talk about, uh, it'll be easy to get that up on the screen for everyone to see. Um, if you want to comment or ask a question, uh, it'd be helpful to post it in the chat window um, and you can get called on as your name appears. This will prevent folks from talking over one another. And you can also just post a question in the chat window and, and myself or, or Kit will go ahead and read it out. Um, as I mentioned before, this event is going to be recorded so we can share it uh, far and wide. So um, this would be a good time to turn on or off your webcam, uh, depending on what your preference is. And since we will be sharing it at the museum, uh, please remember to use family-friendly language and uh, images. So the City Nature Challenge uh, is this really awesome community event that has been going on for, oh, was it, is it, how long, 15 years, Kit? No, actually, I think this is its no? fifth no? year. Fifth year, oh, how, yeah, time, that's how all. time flies. Yeah. <laughs> So using the iNaturalist app, uh, folks anywhere can take pictures of wildlife or other um, plants, animals uh, in your community and use the iNaturalist app to identify and share those. And we are officially in part two of the City Nature Challenge. Uh, so we had about 250 communities uh, participating this year. And we are now in the identification stage. So folks went out, they took pictures of plants and animals, and they tried to identify them. Uh, some got to the species level, some did not. Uh, so we're gathered today to kind of uh, flesh that out and get our observations in. Uh, all of this information is available on the iNaturalist website under our uh, Ann Arbor project. Uh, but just to give you all an idea of kind of how we did, um, we were able to collect over 1,500 observations in our county. Um, and of those, uh, we have about 500 species identified at this point. But as you can see from this um, little uh, kind of pie chart type graphic here, about half of those observations still need identification. So hopefully we can uh, knock quite a few of those out tonight. Jade, there's mm -hmm. one other thing too that um, we have 1500 as of now, but um, folks can continue to put in um, or upload observations that they made over the four days, uh, Monday through, sorry, Friday through Monday, and, uh, and they will still count. So they should show up. So in fact, that number may grow until the end of May 3rd, which is the identification period. So we may not be done yet. In fact, actually, I can tell you we're not done yet because mine aren't all in yet. <laughs> awesome. That means we have, uh, we have even, even more exciting observations to come. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, quite a few people here who have volunteered their time, um, who have a lot of experience identifying these kind of, um, this kind of native wild plants and wildlife. Uh, and I will let each of those folks introduce themselves. Uh, I, I will let you know that Megan and Samuel, uh, who are both PhD students here at the University of Michigan, uh, are unfortunately having some technical issues, but I have them on standby uh, on a text message. So Megan Simmons is um, 
our resident insect expert, and Samuel Schaefer Morrison is a forest ecologist. And uh, any questions that uh, we think that um, they may be able to help with, um, I can reach them by cell phone. So, um, Kit, uh, Maya, and Randy, do you want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Kit Howard, and um, I'm not actually with Ann Arbor Natural Area Preservation, although um, Maya and I um, collaborated quite closely for this. I work for a nonprofit company in the clinical data research space, um, but I've been uh, involved in uh, CNC since last year. I'm a uh, sort of an independent nature nerd. I like pretty much everything uh, in terms of, of types of species, but I have been doing wildflowers for probably about 30 years. And by doing, I mean, you know, taking photographs and um, trying to identify, but uh, finding INAT and CNC gave me a, um, a sort of a, a reason to keep doing it. It was nice to do it for my own sake, but it's really nice to have an excuse and a way to use all those photographs that weren't really good enough for the calendar. <laughs> so um, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. And, uh, and I think it's wonderful that um, we're already at many times our expectation over last year. Uh, so this is, this is very cool. And I'm, I'm looking forward to today. So on to you, Maya. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to attend this live event. My name is Maya. I am the Independent Volunteer Coordinator with the City of Ann Arbor's Natural Area Preservation. Um, the city first became interested in the City Nature Challenge in 2019. So just last year we started getting interested in the City Nature Challenge uh, natural Area Preservation's mission is to protect and restore Ann Arbor's natural areas and to foster an environmental ethic amongst its community. And so the City Nature Challenge brings together those two parts of that one mission really beautifully um, by helping inform us what we have in our local communities that is worth protecting and worth going out there and caring about. And also by getting the community itself engaged in going out and locating those things. So the fact that we've been able to collaborate with the national organization um, in California, so the California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, who put this on every year, as well as our local organizers, such as the University of Michigan Museum of Natural History and others, and all of those folks across the globe has just been a really exciting project these past two years. So thank you all for being here tonight and participating in that. Randy? Hey guys, uh, I'm Randy Singer. I'm, um, I work for the University of Michigan Mu Museum Zoology. I'm the collection manager for the uh, museum's fish collection. So we also, the museum, while you've seen, if you've been to the public museum, you've seen all the wonderful exhibits and educational um, opportunities that exist there. But there's also a research museum where we collect and store and curate um, artifacts of natural natural history, both human and um, non-human. And so I'm responsible for maintaining the fish collection. So we have over 3 million fishes that have been collected over hundreds of years. And, um, and they're just, it's awesome. And we're part of a greater community of museums all across the world where we share data, um, you know, where these, where these organisms have been collected and, you know, what they're eating, what their habitat's like, how it changes from year to year. And, um, and it, you know it's 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 awesome and so i'm happy to participate in these types of events because i'm totally obsessed with identifying animals especially fish uh, i also really like reptiles and amphibians and um, mammals too so hopefully i can give you guys a hand with that um as we go forward and i'm sure that there is no shortage of expertise in in the audience as well um lots of lots of expertise in this community about um our, our natural resources, um, including Justin uh, Shell, who helped organize all of this and is uh, the community science aficionado um, at the University of Michigan and also director of the Shapiro Design Lab. Do you want to say hi, Justin, real quick? Hey, I'm Justin. Um, 
yeah, I, I want to I want to hear more from the experts and things like that. So, but I do a lot with community and citizen science, uh, some online projects and things like that uh, with Zooniverse and stuff like that. So, uh, thanks everyone for being here. I'm glad that uh, when this conversation started with Kit and I a few months ago, even though the circumstances are radically different, we could still make something happen. Okay. So I guess uh, Lisa had a really great, great question. Um, she wanted to know that if she added observations a little while ago, how did they get onto the Ann Arbor project? Is that automatic uh, or do you have to actually sign up? No, your answer was spot on, Jade. It, um, as long as it was taken within the boundaries of Washtenaw County as understood by um, Geo, sorry, Google Maps, um, it will automatically be included uh, as long as it was within the right time frame. So um, local time, Friday to Monday this past weekend. So you don't have to do anything. It's it's there already, which is kind of cool. So uh, I guess uh, let's we can start with sharing some observations. Did anybody see anything uh, during the City Nature Challenge that they um, weren't able to identify or wanted more information about? So Randy, you said you were a fishy person. Does that mean that you're also a other things that live in the water person? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm relatively new to Michigan, but I can usually get most things down to, you know, where you could look for more information in other places. I'm also probably helpful at pointing people to other resources too or other people too. Okay, cool. Because like I said, we have a huge community of people within the museums, so. Okay. So, um, until anybody else puts their hand up, and please feel free to, because I'm one of those people who, if I sense a, a gap, um, I'll jump in to fill it, which generally means that somebody has to tell me to be quiet now. So if anyone else has something to say, please, you know, jump in. Um, otherwise, I've got a, a couple of things that, uh, that I could use. So I will go ahead and grab the screen if I can get my cursor onto the right spot here. Um, so it looks like uh, Lisa said she saw um, muskrats, alligator, snapping turtles, blue herons, and snakes. I, I saw my Ooh. first muskrat this past week and I've never seen one before because I'm from Florida and we don't, I mean, there, there may be muskrats close to Florida, but there definitely weren't anywhere I lived and it was pretty amazing. That is incredible. Yes. The, um, I haven't seen the muskrats, but I see um, a lot of evidence of beaver activity in some of the, uh, the, um, some of the parks I go to. So both um, the trees that have been cut or gnawed down, as well as uh, um, the big furrows that they make as they leave the river and they go into uh, inland to find more trees to kill. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So this um, that should be on your screen, I understand is a, uh, well, it's obviously a frog. So um, what kind of frog is this and, and why do you know and is there anything that else that looks like it in, in this area? Can you see did my you, screen? <laughs> no, yeah, I, I can. Do you, uh, did it make a call? Did you hear it call at all or anything like that? No, actually I was lying on a board over the water and um, and as I moved, it moved. And that's the only reason I saw it. Yeah. I'm just between a couple different ones. I'm just looking at its little legs. That's one of the giveaways. Uh, what couple different ones are you thinking? So the, most of the frogs that are like the ranids like that, that are the like fully aquatic, like you see them hanging on the water. We've got here in Michigan, we have a leopard frog. We've got pickerel frogs, green frogs. Those are the three that I'm bouncing around between. Um, and the and the, the way you can kind of tell it's one of those, like a, like you actually even have it here in your uh, in your 
note, I think you said ran a day or something like that, is that you have what's called a, a tympanum. So if you, if you could see behind the eye, there would be this large disc that's their uh, part of like one of the organs, like their organ they use to listen for other frog calls. They also have a very pointy snout and um, they have those like stereotypical, like when you think of a frog, like a big leaping frog, you know, like a bullfrog or something, they have that similar morphology. So webbed feet, lar long, flat feet for pushing in the water and pushing out of the water. Um, so I'm between those three, but it's kind of hard to tell. Okay. So what, what would I need to have photographed to make it a better photograph for identification? Oh, that's a really good question. Obviously, out of the water is always best. I mean, that's not always possible for sure because mm -hmm. um, it lets the colors really come out because a lot of these um, aquatic frogs like that, you need its color pattern. I mean, they all have the similar shape, but there's like a color pattern. There's usually some other characters with the length of things. So if you could get it, you know, kind of dry on land, that's always the best. But um, your photo is fine. You know, that's a good photo. It's just it, it know, just doesn't show you what you need. Yeah, a couple of little things like uh -huh. the, the color pattern on the side of the body. Um, I'm sure someone who is a herpetologist could could dead ringer it. I would guess that it is a green frog, though, based mm -hmm. on what it what it looks like. Because because um, leopard frogs tend to have a lot more blotchy spot patterns on their back. Mm -hmm. um, pickerel frogs kind of have the same thing. Pickerel and, and leopard frogs look a lot more similar than a green frog and green frogs are also very very common i have a little pond behind my house and there's like a dozen in it right now okay so maya you raised your hand i did and so i wanted to pitch in and say that something that is really cool that i really have been making a lot more use of in terms of iNaturalist during this event uh, was the use of recordings sound recordings I ah. discovered not long ago that iNaturalist does accept sound recordings. You don't even need to have a picture. And I will admit my birding by ear is not as good as my birding by sight. And so there are often times I hear birds, I don't know what they are. So I upload it to iNaturalist, the recording, and I say bird, and I wait for the community to come down and say, this is what we think it is. And so I think something else that's really great about iNaturalist is also that you can sort of do this community agreement and disagreement about particular species so for example the frog that you sent i also kind of think it looks like a green frog i've seen a lot of green frogs and leopard frogs and pickerel frogs um so that's something oh. that i might suggest and then we'll wait and see what the community thinks yeah somebody um, on the community thinks wood frog let me go back to the picture. Whoop. Oh yeah, I see somebody said wood frog. So it is kind of that interesting thing. Um, so, so I have a question. Uh, this is kind of an iNaturalist question. So would the, would the best thing for you to do in this case would be if you think it's a wood frog, kind of tag it is that so that people with more experience can come in and um, confirm that identification? My, I, I have two ways that I approach this. If I'm reasonably certain that I'm right, which in this case, I mean, I'm, I'm not at a low enough level, but if I'm reasonably certain I'm right, then I will go ahead and, and make the call. Um, in something like this, I usually hold back and wait for a bit, especially during CNC. The chances are that somebody else will jump in with something else. But if I want to provoke, <clears throat> um, then the best way to provoke is to get the observation back up at the top of the newest observation. And so I'll put something else in. So in this case, we've got um, some reasonable um, assurance or, or some reasonable confidence that perhaps it's in fact a green frog. So what I might do then is instead go green frog and it comes up as green frog and select that um, based on um, uh, 
Shall I call you an expert, Randy, or an informed? I don't know whether you can. I would definitely not call me a frog expert for <laughs> okay. sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so based on informed opinion of a colleague. It also Something depends like who AP Gar Garm is, because they well, can also be like a herpetologist. <laughs> exactly. So as I recall, um, let's see. So amateur naturalist with interest in everything, which means their guess is probably as good as mine or yours, um, which means it could be perfect. It, it might be, um, it might not be. So I would tend to say, all right, let's do... Sorry, any, obviously, any time you navigate away, it decides, oh, you didn't want that, right? Oh, well, yeah, so, let me add real quick before we get too far away from it when we were talking about sounds. So, like, that's a really good characteristic for birds and also for frogs. Like, frog calls are probably some of the most diagnostic characteristics. Like, one of the best examples is we all know what a bullfrog is. So, bullfrogs sound like, oh, oh. So if you ever hear that, that sounds like somebody's like, I don't know, That's really good. Man or something. <laughs> That's a bullfrog. And it looks almost exactly the same as this other thing called a pig frog. But pig frogs, I kid you not, if you can imagine, they go. Wah, 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 wah. But like visually, you can almost not tell them apart unless you're a seasoned herpetologist. But if you hear them calling, my, I mean, my daughter knows the difference between a pig frog and a bullfrog. So. Mm. I had a, an occasion because I'd heard too that Michigan frogs um, all sound very different. So I had an occasion where uh, I heard a frog. My my backyard has a pond that used to be a pool, and uh, so I would hear this sort of sound, and I made a recording of it. And I listened to every dratted recording I could find on frogs, and I finally gave up. And I sent it to the Michigan State Extension Office. And the guy came back and he said, wow, that's really cool. That's the sound of one male frog getting on another male frog and the second male frog saying, whoops, you've got the wrong person. <laughs> Can I use it for class? <laughs> so um, yeah, so there you are. Uh, sometimes you won't hear what, I mean, you won't find what you heard, but Michigan Extension Office, I've used them a couple of times um, for uh, identification of insects and the, peop the folks who are there are absolutely phenomenal. So that's another um, resource I'd suggest. So it looks like uh, Lisa and Lily found a lot while they were out this weekend. Do you cool. both want to do a screen share and share your iNaturalist observations and see if there's um, anything unique there or anything that hasn't been um, identified to the species level? That'd be great. Yeah, um, I just, I sent a couple photos let me see if I can move this over to share with you guys. And then I have to do the share thing, share screen. Yep. I suggest so sharing your whole screen just because um, that way you don't have to fiddle ah. with uh, applications. Um, yeah, let me put this back over here. So this is what I want to share. Zoom does that. Blue Jeans doesn't do that. Is that where I'm at? Yeah. Mm. So share. We see you. Okay. That's definitely a mastodon. <laughs> <laughs> it we, was, yeah, we uh, were just on a walk and found that in a tree. Uh, there were a bunch of other parts. There were a couple more like that. Um, we think that they're spinal vertebrae. It looked like a deer carcass. There were ribs, there was a pelvis, um, a lot Probably. of other parts, but um, there was no head. Yeah, those are definitely ver vertebrae. Yeah, mm -hmm. that does look like a deer, especially the femur that you correctly did in the first picture. Because um, deer tend to have like these kind of skinny femoral heads, so the top top of the bone. Um, that was Lily that got that. It's like, yeah, so. just, she knows stuff. So um, I'll go back. Can you go that. back one? Yeah. Yeah, so like you see it, so the part that's the leftmost, at the leftmost part of the picture, you have that femoral, yeah, right there. It, it's kind of skinnier. Um, and so that's, it, it's, it's, it's often pretty helpful to get both sides of the, the head. So you can see the, like you can see both sides and 
it in full um, uh, full full review but um, that does look like a, a deer and since it's here it would it would be a white tail deer right um, we actually saw a herd of them the other day when we were walking through the woods and they were kind of like just geez. sort of keep giving us the margin but they were staying by us is there anything that anyone knows that would be big enough to have a femur like that around here other than a deer uh, we've seen what we think were coyotes or either yeah, coyotes we, or we wolves. We did see a wolf one time because it was way too big to be a coyote. But um, I'm not sure. I think this wolves might big. not be this far south though. Yeah. I did think. you saw it in Ann Arbor? Um, over by here on River where my in-laws live. Yep. Are, they were maybe, actually on the ice in the middle of River. Wolf. Oh, those ones were coyotes. Yeah, because I think, I think wolf wolves are only in the UP, but I could be mistaken just based on casual conversations but i could i could be oh, i could be wrong of course you think justin coyotes? were you saying a koi wolf we saw one by the by the va hospital we're pretty sure um mm -hmm. where it's all woodsy over there and it was crossing um Gla uh, by glazier way oh right i know exactly where you're talking about i i know there's there are coyotes over there um because i also agree wolves are pretty much in the UP, there have been some scattered sightings of them uh, in on the mitten, but they're again, mostly very north. Um, it could be, so a koi wolf is a, is a mixed, is, is um, mixed between coyotes and, and dogs. Um, but that, that would be very, that would be a, that would be something if there was a wolf. Yeah, if you uh, could get somehow take an image of it, that or, you know, if you ever saw it again, I know it's hard, but. But the was, main difference between I think coyotes and wolves is, is the snout. It's all in the snout. So coyotes tend to have a very narrowing snout towards the point, and then wolves a very square, broad in, by comparison. But this, this is actually a cast of a wolf skull, if that helps. But um, I mean, because they're they're pretty massive. Um, so a coyote skull is gonna and it, well, this is a this is not a cast of a North American wolf. This is a Siberian wolf, but. Um, because uh, coyote skulls and dog skulls are, are usually going to be a lot smaller than this, uh, but um, so but still, I mean, wolves are like, huge animals, so uh, I don't know. But they, they will they will have that very distinctive kind of canid skull with this kind of gentle gentle sloping forehead, um, okay. etc. Well, we've actually had in person encounters with wolves, so we're familiar with their sizes. We've met with Arctic wolves and mm -hmm. what else, Lils? Uh, Arctic and then two packs of bears uh, down at Seacrest Wolf Preserve in Florida. Wow, very cool. Yeah. Um, what we saw years ago that we thought was a wolf, it, it was, mm -hmm. I would say, nearly mm -hmm. as tall as a deer. It was tall and it had long, shaggy coat, which you wouldn't expect a deer to have. I know that oftentimes when coyotes interbreed with domestic dogs, the kind of net result is the size of those offspring increase, um, much larger than uh, a coyote would be. So um, it would be, yeah, it would be fascinating to see a picture of it. Yeah. So make sure you, you keep your cameras get... charged. <laughs> we need to turn our camera yeah. off. So did you have others that um, you wanted to bring up? The only, those are the only ones I had a chance to upload so far. <gasps> Lily has lots a couple more. that they're on our phones right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I usually do most of my observing with, uh, if I'm going to do it for, you know, deliberately, I take my camera out because um, I don't have the patience with the phone and I also like to use the photographs for other things. So I, I hear you in other words <laughs> on different machinery. Yeah, I could hold my iPhone in front of you, but I don't think that would go across. <laughs> it's a bit tricky. So I have a I have kind of a, a, a an interesting one that is it's similarly evidence of a creature, uh, but not the the creature itself. Um, is everyone familiar with these? No. So, and I, I should have, um, we get a, 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 a second picture. It's always good to have more than one picture. I think that was kind of where I fell short on this one. Um, but this is actually a crayfish burrow. 
and um, oh. I wonder if there is a, a a picture of the burrow. But these, yeah, these these guys actually live underground, and when they burrow, they send they or when they're excavating their burrows, they send up um, the soil from the lower layer to the top and it forms these, uh, these kind of chimneys. And this is, these are a really good way to identify if an area that you're in uh, ever gets uh, flood, seasonally flooded, because uh, crayfish tend to live in these aquatic and semi-aquatic environments. So it's, it's, it's kind of a, a telltale sign that this area is at least an, an ephemeral or a seasonal wetland. I had no idea they lived on land. I mean, I've only, I think I've only ever seen them in the water. Yeah, I, and I'm not, I am not a crayfish expert, but um, as I understand it, when the, um, during the dry season, when the water table drops, they actually use these burrows so that they don't um, desiccate in those, in those seasonal wetland habitats. I was going to say the same thing. I think, I think they definitely are, are burrowing down to the water table because they do breathe through gills. So they're probably getting some amount. They, they don't need much, but they need some water. That's great. Is, uh, is the digger uh, crawfish or crayfish, is that, how, like, how many species are uh, in the area? I'm really, I don't know much, don't know much about them. That's an excellent question, and I honestly, I do not know how many species are in the area either. There's a lot of species of crayfish, particularly in the Appalachians. There's hundreds of species. So <laughs> I don't know about Michigan, but you might be able to look in INAT and see where other people have found crayfish on a map. Um, it could be something to try to get a sense of that, but it might just find specific. I don't know if you could go to the higher level that wouldn't just get to a specific species, but that could be one way to do that. Yeah, you should be able to. I'm, I'm getting into it right now. Let's see, if I grab, um, perhaps those of you who are less familiar with, um, with working through INET might find this useful. Um, Okay, so I just went into INAT and I'm in observations and I'm going to put in crayfish. Okay, so we could go gene, oh no, that's crayfish snakes. I don't think that's useful. <laughs> so let's choose a crayfish worms, crayfish and lobsters. So if we choose that, if we're lucky and I'm in the right place, Come on, sometime today. Okay, we can see a map. Or we can take it down to, what, to what do we want? Michigan, Washtenaw County? Let's do our INAT thing. Washtenaw County. Go. Okay, so we have a few, or maybe it's not finished loading yet. Okay, it says 16 observations, five species that have been observed anyway. Digger crayfish, eastern, big water, virile, and painted hand. Wow, that is a fantastic tool for... Um... Yeah for seeing what's in the area. It really is, or at least seeing what people have observed and uploaded. We have to remember absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. One of my favorite sayings. <laughs> yeah, and you could use museum. Most museums also now have public um, interfaces to look through their data too. So if anybody's interested in that, I can give ah. you information on how to do that too. And that's that should be fairly comprehensive because most of those will have been um, you know, absurd that locality, like Michigan, for example, will have been observed for hundreds of years. So it's mm -hmm. pretty, pretty sure that not not entirely sure, but pretty sure that you know you'll know what's there from that. It's pretty comprehensive. Randy, are you talking about GBIF? 
for that? Yeah, you can use GBIF um, because, it, or you can use things like IDIC Bio, or yeah. um, most museums even now have their own inf interfaces. You yeah. can just search through a museum like the UM Museum or whatever. Mm -hmm. What we just mentioned are just all different sorts of, of repositories or aggregators of different collections. And so GBIF is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And this aggregates over a billion observation records from around the world. Um, and so you can search through these different records and see, um, you know, how populations have changed over time, but also just where things are in the world. And the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology has uploaded a lot of records into that as well. Is, are these repositories the sorts of things that you kind of have to know what you have before you can go and, and find info about it? Or are they organized so, you know, oh, here, I have a, a something that has six legs, it's got dots on its back, I think it's a beetle. Um, you, can, you can start at high, like highest order. You'll have to know something about the taxonomy, but most of that you can get from, you know, just Googling or Wikipedia, like super broad casting searches. And then from that, you could go and do a more fine search. Um, this, yeah, this is where I would bring in something like iNaturalist Seek app that's using uh, some computer vision and things like that to help identify things. So it really depends on, on if you're thinking about this as sort of like an educational tool or like helping you identify something versus you, you sort of know what's there. You want to see sort of a larger spread of things. Um, it's not, won't necessarily help you identify things, but you could see sort of larger patterns or historical patterns or things like that. And if you're looking, for example, looking to find something, or if you're like, oh, I think this might be a whatever, and you know the common name, I know, for example, IDIG Bio, um, use, can you, you can search common names too. So if you're like, I know this is a painted lady crayfish or whatever, you know, like you can type that in and, and it'll give you some results. Okay. Okay. So if I have, which I do, um, a piece of, uh, or a preserve that I help photo monitor and I've toyed occasionally with, hmm, I wonder if I could get photographs of everything that's supposed to be there. INAT obviously will have everything that's been observed there, but Bev Walters has done, and she's, I gather, does a lot of, um, uh, plant surveys. Um, I don't, I think she works with the university, but I'm not sure. Anyway, I know she did a plant survey of that land and I think it would be really cool to find everything that could be there. Um, would one of these repositories or one of these databases be a good place to go in and say, okay, here's my rough um, geographic area. Tell me all the things that anyone's found there. If, if those, That's probably the easiest way to use it, honestly. <laughs> yeah, if those records have been digitized and uploaded and, and gone through the necessary curation process, then mm -hmm. possibly one of the things you can do in GBIF um, is you can actually literally draw a box around an area or a polygon around an area, and you can see the things that you can limit your search just to that. Oh, that's, wow. that's what we do before like our lab, before we go do collecting trips anywhere, like when we're looking mm -hmm. for a target species, we'll still do a search across all museums for the area that we're going and being like, oh, what else can we expect to find while we're here? We do that all the time. Okay, because other people might have come in and had a look at your space kind of thing, your, your physical geology and have records about your geography. Yep, exactly. Yep. Okay, all right, good, cool. Well, other um, observations that anybody would like to um, have have had a look at, have a look at, have folks look at? Oh, uh, we have a link from uh, Teresa. So she just posted it in the chat window. Kit, since you're still sharing your screen, do you want to copy her link so we can um, look at, at that observation? All right, and then there's a fish. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. Let's see. Randy, we're putting you on the spot here. Yeah, that's what definitely is a centrar fish. It's definitely a centrarchid. I think you're on the right track. So centrarchids are are the sunfishes. Um, Lapomus is probably a good. That's the genus I think I saw you had on there. I don't. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be like Lapomus. Um, like Megalotus, Macrochiris, one of those. Yeah. Um, the way you tell a lot of those species apart is so they all have. Um, you know, they basically are in the same family as bass. So like the bass that people use, you know, recreational sport fishing or whatever. So 
the way you know you have a sunfish is if you have something that looks like a bass, but it looks like it ran into a wall and is taller than it is longer. And you have two dorsal fins. One will be rounded and very soft, and one will be like kind of long and uh, rectangular and be spiny. So they have a first dorsal fin that's spiny and a second dorsal fin that's soft. And then uh, all the sunfishes pretty much have this little um, tag on their operculum. So the operculum is the gill cover. So if I do a, you know, like, like these things, these are the operculums. Um, and they have a little tag that sticks off of it. And some of them, so if it's a um, mega lotus, like lotus being ear, it has a long tab. So it's a long eared sunfish. There's macrochirus. And so this, the way you would, the only way I would know is if it was that one is if I could hold it in my hand and macrochirus, chirus being macro big hands. And so if you took its pectoral fin, which is basically on a, on a person, it would be like the one, you know, your hand, your arms would be your pectoral fin. So the ones right behind the gills right there. If you took them and flipped them forward, they would touch the snout. They have really, really long pectoral fins. And so those are just some examples of how you would identify a, a blue uh, or a bluegill or a sunfish or, or, you know, whatever. But yeah, I think you're definitely right. It's definitely some kind of centrarchid or a and, sunfish. And where, um, Teresa, where did you find that um, that particular fish at? Or where could one find this fish if they were looking to see one in the wild? Is it Pickney? Nice. Randy, all I could think of when you were um, describing those pectoral fins was that the fish could actually face palm itself. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. If, if it had a reason to, it could. Yep. And sun, sunfishes, there are some, you should, you know, if you're ever really looking for a good time, just Google uh, sunfishes and they, in breeding colors, they are absolutely gorgeous. The, one of my favorites is the pumpkin seed sunfish and they're bright orange color on their breast with um, black outlines around it that literally look like it's just covered in pumpkin seeds and um, and they're, they're a characteristic North American fish. Like, you know, they're not really, they're not found anywhere else. So they're, they're kind of like, if we had a fish mascot for the, for North America, it would be the, uh, sunfishes because we don't, they're not found anywhere else. So, oh yeah. Look at that pumpkin seed. Wee. That's gorgeous. So is that the same name? sunfish as those absolutely humongous orange um ocean fish yes yes yeah, so ones, that's why silly little fins on the side of this enormous disc so this is this is a good aside in why common names especially for fishes are absolutely <laughs> terrible so uh you know it, it actually gives you almost a lot of times almost no information about what you're seeing so that's why you always communicate in scientific names another good example is the electric eel it's not an eel. <laughs> so, you know, lots of, lots of funny things like that, but yeah, it has the same, same common name, except I think technically the, the sunfish you, is, they usually call it the ocean sunfish or the mola mola. That's another name. Okay. For it, but, right. but you're right. They're both sunfish. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Those things. Wow. That is very different. They you guys didn't expect to talk about Mola Mola when we were talking about Michigan observations. <laughs> pretty, pretty awesome. Apparently, they just keep getting bigger. They, as far as anybody knows, they just don't stop growing. <laughs> yeah, most, most fishes are like that. Given enough time and space, they will continue to grow. grow. That's amazing. So did we have another... Um, another what's he thingy url that's the word i'm looking for and yes those are real fish <laughs> okay. don't don't worry they actually they eat mostly jellyfish so you don't have anything to worry uh, about with the ocean sunfish and another sweet factoid while we're here is that the ocean sunfish are some of the most parasitized fish on the planet. Their bodies are absolutely riddled with parasites. Um, nobody really exactly knows why, but there are entire groups of parasites that have been described only from the bodies of Mola Mola. So 
Oh my God, that is wild. Very strange. That really is. Well, so I know that fish. Kit was kind <laughs> enough to put together a um, kind of a filter of all of the observations that haven't been uh, identified in Washtenaw County for the City Nature Challenge. So I am going to post that in the chat. Mm -hmm. And actually, we can post the list of those. We've got um, filters set up for Washtenaw County animals, um, plants, uh, unidentified, um, uh, casual, because of course a lot of folks were having to do this from home um, these days. Uh, but let's see if I can share my screen, then perhaps we can go through a few of these. Um, Jade, you had asked early on whether we wanted a hard stop at seven or folks could continue. Personally, I'm fine to continue if anybody else wants to stay on and or you do, um, or we can stop. Either way is fine by me. Um, or I can leave the, um, the application up and folks can continue or whatever, whatever anybody wants. There, that's the direction I want. So this is, <clears throat> let's see, we can do this. And this is observations, uh, this is ID. So what I can probably do then is just go through slowly. And if somebody sees something that they think they could um, take a stab at identifying more than is there, um, then I can stop. Does that sound like a reasonable approach? Sure, I think some folks need to head out for the night, but if we could mm -hmm. just go through maybe one or two of these so um, folks watching the video can see how they can help remotely uh, and what the process is to confirm some of those IDs, uh, that would Absolutely. be helpful. Absolutely. So, any snail people? River mussel? flies down to non-biting midges oh my on moss yes Ooh, at least it look. doesn't bite <laughs> that's right look at those antennae those are something okay some more non-biting midges a mallard <clears throat> so oh, yes here's a, a factoid for you also on inat there are lots and lots of bird people if you put a, a decent bird photograph up, it will get attacked hmm, within probably about 30 seconds. <laughs> At least that's been my experience because the bird folks are on there a lot and, and they're comparatively speaking, not that many bird observations, not like there are plants um, or, uh, or some of the other options. Ground beetle, that's a nice photo. Ant eggs. See, ah, so this is something nice to see. So we've got a couple of people who have um, suggested the family, somebody who's brought it down to the, um, the genus, and then folks having a discussion in the comments section. And this is a really useful place to, um, to put uh, your rationale for why you think um, the observation is what you're suggesting it is. Um, or if you disagree with something, this is a place to say, this is why I think um, perhaps uh, this identification might be a little bit better. Um, so it's, uh, it's also a way to make a little bit more gentle a disagreement. So it's not the sort of the snap and slap in the face, no, this is not what it is, <laughs> but a way to, uh, to make it a little bit nicer. Um, okay, so we've got... Um, <clears throat> Somebody must have uh, knocked into the ants. So. I have a question about um, cicada shells, and I am I am phoning our um, insect expert. Uh, and I saw it, it somewhere as I was I was scrolling through this list of unidentified um, creatures that someone had posted. Uh, 
a picture of a cicada shell, but there are many species of cicada. And I'm curious if there's any way that you can identify a cicada species uh, just by that molting. So let's see if we add uh we can start with super family ah okay so we have that's my observations <laughs> yeah i have noticed you do lots of observations elliot <laughs> yeah excellent yeah okay so is your insect expert responding Megan says that it is possible, but it would have to be a very morphologically distinct species. Mm. Um, what does morphologically distinct mean? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. It means that you could probably see all the legs, see the reproductive part, like where the reproductive parts would be, probably see the, you know, like mouth parts. Like sometimes if you get a really fresh cicada shell, you can see those things, but if you don't. That's a very high quality image though. But so just for the next time, if you were trying, if there was a way to do it, you would probably want to take what's like a ventral shot. I don't know if you have one on there, but that's probably the most useful information I would assume for them. Ventral yeah. shot. Sorry, sorry, the, the, the tummy. Thank you. Mouth parts might be diagnostic too. I let, a lot of insect things are legs, my, mouth parts, and where the genitalia are. So it's, most of it can be done from the ventral surface. Yeah. Wow. This is an amazing photograph, Elliot. Oh, I don't, that one's not mine. Oh, it isn't? Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> yours was very good too. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. It's still, a, it is. Uh still really good it's yeah. still a really good one i've always had problems with cicadas um I, I mean i don't really know anything about cicadas but um uh but i'll find that when i post like live living breathing cicadas sometimes people will um uh you know because I've, I've gone off like ai suggestions before and you know just like kind of blindly put a species up but i don't really know what i'm talking about um with them but people have come and like kind of dial it back to some larger taxonomic grouping because in some cases cicadas can be difficult even if they're living and breathing with so many mm -hmm. shells. Mm -hmm. no, it is good because a lot of, but uh, it's a good point that a lot of different animals are in, in living organisms are need, it's helpful to get certain, certain shots to identify them mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and not just that, but also um, sometimes it takes an experience like that to realize that, oh, you know, I think spring beauty. Well, there's one kind of spring beauty, right? It's a spring beauty, is a spring beauty, is a spring beauty. Well, no, actually, there are at least two different species. And so you come to realize that, in fact, the name that you're using is perhaps a genus name or, or in a common name, but that there's, there are a lot more of them. And um, like I was doing um, observations on, uh, well, in the spring, in the, um, uh, the stream that I was showing before, where the frog was. And there were all kinds of things that I took, you know, photos of. Mostly what I learned were um, mayfly larvae. And I thought, well, you know, I'll post up five or six of these things and somebody will probably tell me stop posting so many of the same thing in the same place. And, you know, that's okay. No, they came back with like five different, uh, you know, um, identifications for these things. And so what looked to me to be absolutely identical turns out not to be. Um, they were in fact different things. So I have the beholder. Uh, long and rambling um, story to say, yes, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> yeah, that is an interesting conundrum of, of how do you know if you're taking uh, pictures of the the same species multiple times or or multiple species it's, uh, mm -hmm. better to take more photos and have more observations than to to miss something that may be novel that's right 
and this is usually what I say if people are like, oh, why do you why do you want to take pictures of squirrels or rabbits or things like that that are very populous? Like even even if there's a lot of them, like a dip in that population might be indicative of something. And so even if it was some, it's not just looking for sort of charismatic species that you don't see mm -hmm. very often. Um, there's a great podcast uh, episode from 99% Invisible about the great squirrel count in Central Park um, and how, and the different reasons they were trying to count every squirrel in Central Park for different reasons. I have to confess, I'd have to listen to that one because I can't imagine why you'd want to. <laughs> so that, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, I find there was a there was a a thread on the iNaturalist forum, um, which if you're not familiar with it is a, where iNaturalist folks go to um, to chat, and there was a thread there about being blind to certain species, and I realize I'm really quite grass blind. I'll go in and if I, all I see is grass, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing living there, and I don't even realize I'm making that judgment. Admittedly, and we will probably get into this tomorrow with the plant discussion, admittedly grasses are some of the most challenging <laughs> plants to identify. <laughs> yeah, big time. Okay, so um, spider people. No, we're not gonna do a domestic dog. Without fail, there's someone who puts up a picture of the kid or, you know, the friend or whatever. Oh, here we go. Here's another bone. This one's suggested to be something in the, the ducks, geese, and swans. Yeah, that, one, that one's also my observation. Because I know it's a, it's, a, it's a bird humorous. I found that at a Gallup Park. Um, hmm. Don't know much about birds beyond general morphology, but I think that the most likely contender would be a Canada goose based on the size, but because there's so many there, but um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So what cued you off that this was a bird bone? Um, so birds, well, so like one big thing about bird bones is that they're super light because um, they are they have relative to like mammals or reptiles. Um, they have a uh, more pneumatized um, internal structure. And so actually, I think part of that bone's broken too. I don't know if you can see it on the picture, but I could see it when I uh, had it in my hand. But if you look inside, so like the trabeculae, like the internal, um, like that internal architecture uh, is, is more widely kind of spaced and more open. So that's one really big thing that clues you into a bird. Um, the overall shape of this bone uh, it just looks like a bird humerus to, to me, which is um, a bird bone that I, uh, that I think for some reason I, I feel like is kind of commonly just kind of left about for whatever taphonomic reasons or whatever. I don't know, sure, but they're, but I've just become familiar with them. But um, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert with, with bird bones. I know sometimes you can diagnose them based upon like the slant of the of the head of the humerus there, so it'd be the top of the bone in this picture. Um, um, but again, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not an expert with them or with ducks, geese, and swans. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a I, I am pretty confident that's what the family is. Um, but that, mm -hmm. that was a guess. I think that's that really also fascinating. Yeah, I think it also points to just there's there's no substitute for getting out there and just seeing and looking and touching and trying to ID. It's just, you know, the, the, the familiarity of it that you just can't get from the books. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, um, I, I was, I was kind of hoping a bird person would come and just deal with that, but. Uh, <laughs> they still might, there's plenty of time. Okay, moth person? Lots of moths, bumblebees,
lots of bugs. Well, it looks like I'm seeing in the chat window that uh, more folks need to get on to their evening plans. Uh, wow, is that a Isn't that gorgeous? Photograph. Wow. Um, so maybe uh, we should think about wrapping uh, mm -hmm. tonight up, but we will be convening tomorrow at the same time, six o'clock. And uh, the link that you received today will work for tomorrow's session as well, but I will send out uh, a reminder email. As I mentioned in the chat, many of us here are plant people. So uh, tomorrow is certain to be a pretty riveting uh, discussion. Um, and for the sake of folks that will be watching this video after it gets posted, um, iNaturalist is not just for the City Nature Challenge. You can use it anytime, anywhere. And uh, it's free for download on your smartphone, uh, but there is also a website. So if you take photos uh, on a camera, you can bring them back and upload them later. So um, does anybody have any other kind of closing thoughts? Thanks, Thank everybody, you, for organizing this. Yeah, and thanks for the invitation to come. This is really fun. Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks for everybody yeah. for showing and, um, you know, allowing us to do something fun even while we're all shut down. You know, it's nice to be able to do it. Okay, great. Well, yeah, hopefully think, we'll see uh, some of you tomorrow. Yeah, mm -hmm. I learned a lot about using iNaturalist and about some features that even though I've been using it for a couple of years, I, I didn't even know existed, like the filters. Mm. Okay, everyone. I hope you have a good night. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.